Okay, 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the enemy of the king of Aram. He was a great man in sight of his master and a high regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders of Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing, a letter that he took uh, to the king of Israel, read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Make the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horse and chariot and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a message to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, his God. We uh, wave his hand over spots and cure me of my leprosy. Are not, are not Abner and Farah, Parfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all these waters in Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went in a rage. Naaman's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, uh, Wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, and as the man of God had told him, and his, uh, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. There, then Naaman and his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except is in Israel, so please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As sure as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make a burnt offering and sacrifice to any other gods but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive me, forgive your servant, for this one thing, when my master enters the temple of Rimon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also. When I bow down in that temple of Rimon, may the Lord forgive me, forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, said Elisha. After Naaman had traveled some distance, Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master was too easy on Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he brought. As as surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running towards him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Is everything all right? he asked. Everything's all right, Gehazi answered, my master sent me 
to say, two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give me, give them a, a, a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. By all means, take two talents, said Naaman. And he urged Gehazi to accept them and then tied up two talents of silver and two bags with uh, two sets of clothing. He gave them to, um, to his servant and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. When Gehazi came to the hills, he took the things from the servants and put them away in the, ha uh, in the house. He sent the men away and left. When he went into, stood before his master, Elisha, sorry, when he stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? You have seven, didn't go anywhere, Gehazi answered. But Elisha said to him, was not my spirit with you when, you, when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? It's is this the time to take money or accept clothes or olive grooves or vineyards or flocks and herds of male and female slaves? Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence and his skin was leprous in the, and it became as white as snow. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Naaman had leprosy, or at least some sort of skin complaint. It was a terrible thing to happen. It would have cost him his place in society, his health, his wealth, his future. There was no cure. But, you know, there was and there is, there still is a worse disease than leprosy. There's a pandemic that threatens to engulf our society and our world, something more lethal and more easily spread than coronavirus, and it's called hopelessness. We see it in so many places. We recognize it as a tendency in ourselves. Hope seems like a fragile gift, and the enemy wants nothing more than to take it from us. Like coronavirus, we have to take steps to prevent the spread of hopelessness in our own heart and in each other. It spreads when we feed on news reports and Facebook posts instead of on the Word of God. It spreads when our conversation is all about the negative and not stopping to see the good things God is doing. It spreads when we cut ourselves off from God and other Christians. Naaman probably came very close to hopelessness. He was facing the loss of everything he had. But it seems he wasn't quite ready to give up hope completely. And the spark of hope in Naaman's life comes from a very surprising source. You see, Naaman, as it said in the passage, was an enemy of Israel. He was the servant of a cruel and oppressive enemy state. We've been hearing about the Aramean attacks through the books of Samuel and 1 Kings, and they persistently attack Israel, even though they keep losing. But as well as the big documented battles, there are the little border raids, where an armed group take what they want from the Israel's outlying towns by force. And on one of those raids, they captured a little girl who's now serving Naaman's wife. It would seem likely, therefore, that Naaman was involved in this raid, but even not, even if he just bought the girl in the slave market, he was certainly involved in raids like it. What happened? Well, we don't know. Maybe the girl's parents were killed, or maybe they were also sold into slavery, or maybe they're at home mourning for her. Whichever way, it's an awful situation. And this young girl, obviously old enough to remember to know about God and his servants. She feels sorry for her master. She has compassion on the man who has done this, the representative of her enemies. We are carriers of hope when we show undeserved love and compassion. We are carriers of hope when we forgive and we put others before ourselves. 
We see in her no self-pity, though she's got a lot to be sad about. I mean, we're fed up enough that we can't see our families for a few months. Love, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It does not keep a record of wrongs. This little girl is showing that kind of love for her mistress and her master. That kind of selflessness. And that's the reason that she's able to bring hope to them. We are carriers of hope when we speak about the hope that is in us. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. She doesn't just express in vague terms uh, good wishes that Naaman might get well again. She grounds the hope that she has in the God she knows and in the man that God has called and empowered to be a channel of that hope. You know, it's all too easy when our non-Christian friends and family and colleagues tell us their problems to, to wish them well, to sympathize, but not to speak of the hope that is in us. And, and with us, we don't have to say, if only you could go, if only you were near, because the Holy Spirit is right here with us, not in distant lands. We can offer to pray. We can speak of our hope, which, of course, is not to say that we in any way make light of their troubles. <laughs> and we certainly don't suggest that as Christians we don't have such problems. So, Naaman gains hope. How much he thought it would help, we can't be sure. But he's got no better idea. So he goes to the king, who's also willing to give it a shot. Not only does he let his commander go, but he, he personally funds the trip with a substantial amount of money. Hope has spread from a slave girl to her mistress to Naaman and to the king. Three people who do not know God, and yet they're willing to try it. In a very real sense, this is a display of humility. Listening to a female slave, almost a non-person, going cap in hand to an enemy country, abandoning their own God and begging a foreign deity for help. But the king of Israel is altogether less admirable. We don't learn his name in this story, but I assume that it was Joram or one of the other kings descended from Ahab, who, as I said last time, were not a lot better than that man, the worst ever king of Israel. It didn't help that the letter that the other king sent didn't mention the prophet. Just ask the king to heal Naaman. And it comes from his enemy, so the king might see it as some sort of cunning plan, a trap, an excuse maybe to pick a fight. But the king knew Elisha. Am I God, he asks, and of course the answer is no. Can I kill and bring back to life? No. But you know someone who can. Or at least, more accurately, someone through whom God works and will work. But it's left to Elisha to remind him. He must have been making quite a fuss that Elisha heard about it. Or perhaps there was someone in the palace with more common sense than the king, someone on whose heart God laid the thought to go and find the prophet. And so the whole retinue moves from the palace to Elisha's house. And Elisha sends them a message. What? That's an important person, Elisha. This is a great evangelism opportunity. Maybe it's a great peace opportunity for the country. It wouldn't hurt to go out and see him. But God is at work. Naaman has to be shown that there is a God of Israel and that that God is no respecter of persons. Naaman has shown humility, as I said, but he needs to come lower yet before God so that God can deal with him. And that's something we all have to learn at some point. 
when we think we know best, when we're still relying on our own resources, when we think God's way is too hard or too weird or even too simplistic, when we try and do it our way, God cannot deal with us. Go and wash seven times in the Jordan. It's just not what Naaman was expecting. He wanted respect from the prophet. He wanted a good religious display. Do you know the big advantage in religion? It means we can do this ritual or that sacrifice and expect a corresponding, a corresponding response from God. So who's in charge there? God just wants us to surrender and let him do as he chooses. And Naaman has to learn this lesson. Washing in the river? I could have done that at home in much nicer rivers. Fortunately for Naaman, he has courageous advisors. I guess Naaman must have been a nice guy at heart because he does seem to have the respect of his staff as well as his wife's slave girl. They care too much to let him pass up this opportunity. So he washes and he's healed. Now he's convinced. He doesn't just as so many would choose to add Yahweh to his catalog of gods. He's realized that Yahweh is God with a capital G, the God of all the world. There is no God except in Israel. And it's because the God is in Israel that he chooses to take some soil back with him to make a space where he can worship this true God. That seems odd to us. Very strange, even, even a bit idolatrous. But, but to him, it's an important symbol. Yahweh is the God of Israel. So when he does his daily devotion to God, it will be to the God of Israel, symbolized by standing on Israel's soil. He knows that even then he'll get compromised. He'll have to go into the temple with his master, into the temple of the God that he now recognizes as false, and he'll have to bow when his master does. Elisha says he should have peace about this. Now that doesn't mean that we, as the people of God, can expect to live a life of double standards. It's not going to be possible to say to God, look, God, sorry, I know you're the true God, but I've got to go on cheating people because that's what my boss expects. Sorry for watching that graphic film, Lord, but you understand my ex family expected me to join in. No, we're called to holiness, to stand out. Naaman believed, but he didn't join God's holy people. He embraced the worship of God and was in a sense accepted by God, but you and I, like the people of Israel, are called to holiness without compromise. Let's not be fooled. Not like Gehazi was. Gehazi thought he could pull a fast one. Naaman wanted to reward the prophet. Well, the king's given him plenty of stuff to do it with, but Elisha refuses to have anything to do with it. Gehazi thinks differently. Why shouldn't we make a bit of money out of him? He's not even one of us. He's, he's the enemy. Some of that stuff probably came from looting our land anyway. I want some of that. And Naaman's more than happy to give it to him. So why not? Well, it's because God's gifts are not for sale. God is our provider and he gives us freely to the outsider as he does to us. If you want what Naaman had, Elisha tells him, fine, have his leprosy too. God calls us to hope, to love, to humility, to dependence, and to holiness. There's something else in this story too, something that's not mentioned in the text. It's an unspoken fact, but Jesus mentions it. In Luke 4, 27, we read this. There were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. Jesus says this just after he's been rejected by the synagogue in his hometown. Sometimes the people of God become complacent. Sometimes 
we stop seeing things God's way. And it takes someone from outside to wake us up to what we have, what God is doing. Are we awake to what God is doing in this time of pandemic, in this time of international crisis? Are we going to cling on to our religious structures and the way things were? Or will we cry out to God to open our eyes so that we see things his way? Naaman had a slave girl who pointed him to God. He had servants who urged him to listen, and he listened. The people of Nazareth heard the words of Jesus, and they just said, well, he's the carpenter's son. Paul, in Romans chapter 11, urges us to consider and recognize our position. We have been made part of God's family through grace. But just like the people of Nazareth, the people of Israel, none of us is immune to complacency and blindness. And we have to take care that we continue on the path he has for us, staying close to him. Brothers and sisters, God's holy people, let's be alert to hear him speaking at this time. Let's have the humility to do what he calls us to do, even if it's not the way we saw it happening. Amen.